Our lesson today is chapter one, section one. <clears throat> and we're going to start by discussing the number system. Real numbers are found at the top of our number system. <clears throat> Real numbers can be divided into two uh, groups. The irrational numbers and the rational numbers. Rational numbers are any real numbers that can be written as fractions. So examples would be two-thirds, <clears throat> um, negative one-half. Three is a rational number because it can be written as the fraction three over one. Numbers that cannot be written as fractions are irrational numbers. Numbers like pi, square root of two, Square root of 10 is an irrational number. Irrational numbers can be written as decimals <clears throat> that don't terminate or repeat, but they cannot be written as fractions. Rational numbers can be divided into two groups. Subsets of the rational numbers are the non-integers and the integers. <clears throat> if we take a look at our examples of our rational numbers, 2 thirds is going to be a non-integer. Negative one-half is a non-integer, but three is an integer. The entire set of integers can be expressed using set notation. <clears throat> In set notation, we put three dots at either end to indicate that the numbers go on and on forever in both directions. And we enclose our numbers with braces. The integers can be divided into two subsets, the negative integers and the whole numbers. Okay. Negative integers using set notation would look like this, <clears throat> negative three, negative two. Negative one is going to be the largest negative integer. <clears throat> and zero is going to be the smallest whole number. Whole numbers can be divided into two groups. Zero and the count numbers. The counting numbers are the positive integers, and they're also called the natural numbers. Using set notation, one, two, three, and so on, are positive integers. <clears throat> okay, in this first example, we want to graph real numbers, three, two-thirds, negative one-half, pi, and the square root of two on a number line. <clears throat> then write those numbers in increasing order. Every real number can be found on a real number line. So that's what we use to graph our real numbers. A real number line has arrows at both ends indicating that it goes on and on in both directions forever. It has equally spaced units, and we label those equally spaced units with our integers. We have zero in the center, <clears throat> that's called the origin. And we have positive integers to the right and negative integers to the left. Be sure to pause the video and um, read the terms and definitions that are included in the video for you. You might want to include them in your notes of this video. Okay, first real number we're going to graph is 3, so we'll locate 3 on our number line, <clears throat> and we'll graph it using a dot or a point. Then we're going to graph 2 thirds, so we'll find that between 0 and 1. We'll locate its position, we'll label it with its coordinate or number, and graph it again with a point. Okay, we're going to graph negative 1 half, so that's going to be between negative 1 and 0. So we'll locate, label, and graph. <clears throat> Pi is approximately 3.14, so we'll find that just to the right of 3. 
again, we'll locate, label, and graph with a point. Square root of 2, if you put in your calculator, you'll find is approximately 1.4. So we'll locate that between 1 and 2. Label with the coordinate, square root of 2, and graph with the point. Now when we write these numbers in increasing order, we're going to read our number line from left to right, because smaller numbers are to the left and larger numbers are to the right on the number line. So we use the number line in, to order our real numbers. Negative one-half would be the smallest. <clears throat> Two-thirds would be the next largest. The square root of two comes next. Then we have 3, and the largest real number that we graphed is pi because it's furthest to the right on our number line. <clears throat> Next, we'll look at properties of real numbers for addition and multiplication. The first property is the closure property. When two real numbers are added or multiplied, the resulting sum or product is also a real number. The commutative property says that if we add any two real numbers, like a and b, together, we can add them in any order. We can commute those terms or move them and still get the same sum. So a plus b is equal to b plus a. The commutative property also holds for multiplication. a times b is equal to b times a. The associative property involves grouping or associating these terms or factors. So if we want to add a plus b plus c, we can choose to first add a plus b together and then add c, or we could add b plus c <coughs> and then add a. The associative property holds for multiplication also. So we could choose to multiply a times b together first and then multiply by c, or we can multiply b times c together and then multiply by a. <coughs> the identity property asks, what do we add to a in order to get a back? And that uh, additive identity element is 0. a plus 0 is equal to a. What do we multiply to any real number a in order to get the identical number a back? And that multiplicative, multiplicative identity element is 1. a times 1 is equal to a. The inverse property says what do we add to a in order to get that additive identity element 0? We'd have to add the opposite of a to a in order to get 0. a plus negative a <coughs> is equal to 0. What do we multiply to any real number a in order to get the multiplicative identity element 1? We multiply reciprocals together in order to get positive 1. <coughs> so the reciprocal of a is 1 over a, and their product is positive 1. The distributive property involves both addition and multiplication. a times the sum b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. When we distribute, we get rid of parentheses by multiplying that factor outside of parentheses to each term inside of parentheses. Here we have four problems to solve. <clears throat> what is the opposite of negative 2 and 5 sevenths is our first problem. Negative 2 and positive 2 are opposites because when we add them together, we get 0. Also, negative 2 and positive 2 are the same distance from 0 on the number line, only in opposite directions. 5 sevenths has an opposite of negative 5 sevenths because when you add them together, you get 0. In problem 2, it says, what is the reciprocal of negative 2 and of 5 sevenths? 
the reciprocal of negative 2, since negative 2 can be written as negative 2 over 1, is 1 over negative 2, or negative 1 half. If you multiply negative 2 times negative 1 half, you'll get positive 1. The reciprocal of 5 sevenths <coughs> is 7 fifths. And again, if you multiply those reciprocals together, you'll get positive 1. In problem 3, we want to subtract 7 and negative 12. We subtract in that order because subtraction is not commutative <coughs> like addition is. So 7 minus negative 12 is not the same as negative 12 minus 7. But we don't subtract in algebra, we add the opposite. So this becomes 7 plus the opposite of negative 12, which is positive 12. And 7 plus 12 is 19. <coughs> in problem 4, we want to divide negative 2 and 5 sevenths. Again, we have to divide in that order because division is not commutative like multiplication is. So negative 2 divided by 5 sevenths or negative 2 over 1. We don't divide by a fraction, we multiply by its reciprocal. So we're going to multiply by 7 fifths, which is the reciprocal of 5 sevenths. And when we multiply fractions, we multiply numerators and multiply denominators. So negative 2 times 7 would give us negative 14 on top, and 1 times 5 would give us 5 on the bottom. So negative 14 fifths is our solution uh, or our answer. And it doesn't simplify because there's no factor in common, top and bottom. Okay, on this last page, we're um, not going to have time to go through every one of these problems uh, on the video, but we can in class tomorrow. Um, let's try the first one. You work eight hours and earn $60. What is your earning rate? In order to get an earning rate, we'd want that in dollars per hour. So we'd have to divide $60 by 8 hours. Okay, and if we divide in our calculator, 60 divided by 8, <coughs> we'd find out that our earning rate is $7.50 per hour. You can try problems 2, 3, and 4 in your uh, notes. Um, and if you have questions, we'll go over those, uh, like I said, tomorrow. <clears throat> I'd also like you to try guide, guided practice problems 1 through 14, found on pages 3 through 5 of your textbook before coming to class tomorrow. Include them in your notes of this video.